Hello and uh, welcome to lecture number eight in our series of geometrical and physical optics lectures. The title of this lecture is Laser Construction. With this lecture we are continuing our study of lasers that we started with the previous lecture. We are going to be talking about laser cavities, laser mirrors, the materials that are being used to construct the lasers, and finally some of the laser output characteristics as well as how to classify the lasers. In the previous lecture we analyzed the wave of laser operation and in this lecture we are going to look at the most important piece parts of a laser that enable that type of laser operation. This slide here shows an overview of the basic structure of a laser. So the laser consists of excitation medium that is going to be used to pump the energy into the laser cavity and then we have a laser cavity or amplifying medium inside the laser cavity that is gonna be supporting the lasing action. And finally, on each side, we have two mirrors. On the left-hand side, we have a high reflectivity mirror. And then on the right-hand side, we have another mirror that also serves as output coupler that is gonna be passing the laser beam uh, outside the laser cavity. Here we have an overview of different types of mirrors that are used in optical cavities in lasers. There's a multiple configurations that you may come across. We may have a plane parallel mirrored cavity, spherical mirror cavity, long radius mirror cavity, confocal, hemispherical, long radius hemispherical cavity, and finally concave convex mirror cavities. In this lecture, we are not going to be explaining the advantages and disadvantages of each of these different mirrors that is going to be the subject for our course number four. But for now, just remember that the mirrors in a laser can come in a various shapes and sizes and each of them has a certain advantages and disadvantages and is going to serve for a specific type of a laser or laser application. In the previous lecture, we elaborated that in a laser, a process of light amplification is taking place that's directly related to the gain. So we can define so-called loop gain, which is the overall gain in a laser cavity during the one round trip of laser photons. So what's happening inside the laser is as the photon is being created, it's going to be propagating in a certain horizontal direction. It's going to hit the mirror on the left hand side. It's going to come back as a reflected photon. Again, it's going to go to the lasing medium in which it is going to excite more of uh, atoms to the point of creation of more of the photons. And then finally, it's going to come over on the other side. It's going to hit uh, the mirror on the right hand side and it's going to come back. So that is going to be one loop, one full loop that a photon is going to complete in a laser cavity and during that loop a certain number of uh, photons is going to be created through the process of photon interaction uh, with the lasing medium. So we can calculate so-called loop gain and we can see in the formula on the right hand side what is the loop gain uh, affected by. So we have two quantities here R1 and R2 that represent the reflectivities of the two mirrors. In other words, that's a percentage of uh, photons that have been reflected off of the mirror. And then we have another parameter here, G sub A, that represents the gain of the medium, depends on the properties of the medium that's been used. In other words, if you have a gas versus a solid state versus a semiconductor laser, all of these different types of lasers will be using a different type of a material that is going to have a different uh, properties that would affect the loop gain in a laser. That effect, that impact has been captured through this parameter G sub A. And finally, we have capital L, which represents the loss factor. In other words, when a light is propagating to the lasing medium, there is going to be the interaction with the medium, not only in the sense of a stimulated emission through which more photons are created, but also in the sense of absorption, certain amount of light that's been created in the laser is going to be absorbed back into the medium. So a certain number of photons are also going to be lost. So to wrap up the loop gain that represents the overall gain in a laser cavity during one round trip of uh, laser photons is going to be the function of reflectivities of the two mirrors, properties of the medium, lasing medium, that's going to be captured through these two parameters GA that represents the property of the lasing medium to support the stimulated emission as well as the parameter L that represents the losses in uh, the lasing medium. We are also going to briefly introduce so-called transverse mirrors in a laser. It turns out that electromagnetic waves that are directly related to the light uh, th that make up the laser beam have electric and magnetic fields. And it turns out that 
that whole electromagnetic field that's been created in a laser can be broken down into so-called modes. There's a multiple modes that can exist in a laser that are going to uh, establish or affect uh, in a variation in intensity across the entire laser beam diameter or laser beam cross section. So what you can see on the right hand side are a few different types of transverse modes starting with the TEM00 mode which would have a certain spread of intensity across the cross section of the laser beam and then you also can see here TEM10 mode, TEM20 etc. Each of these different modes would have a different distribution of the intensity of the light across the entire cross section of the beam. It turns out that certain lasers can have multiple modes and if those multiple modes are being added they create a specific distribution of the intensity of the laser light on the cross section of the laser beam. So for example, if you're looking at the one that's shown here in the bottom on the left hand side, if you have a laser that only creates the TM00 mode, in such a case, you will be your laser will be working on the curve, so-called Gaussian or bell-shaped curve. The maximum intensity of the light will be at the center of the beam. And if your laser supports not only TM00, but TM10 and TM20 mode, those would be looking like these curves that you can see there that will be adding up and creating a total distribution of the intensity of, of the laser beam as shown here. In other words, the spread of the intensity is gonna be kind of more uniform. Uh, if you look at the center of the uh, laser beam, uh, the intensity in the center is gonna be much closer to the intensity at the edges of your uh, laser beam cross section, as opposed to the laser that creates only TEM00 mode where, as you can see here on this curve, the peak or the maximum of the intensity will be at the center of the laser beam, while at the edges it's gonna be dropping down to almost zero. Let's now shift our attention to the laser materials. As we already said, there is going to be a laser cavity inside of each laser. On one side we have a mirror, on the other side we also have a mirror, and then between the mirrors we have this so-called laser cavity that's filled by a specific type of a material that is going to support the stimulated emission. It turns out that uh, the materials that can be used as uh, lasing materials would come in the shape of a gas, solid or liquid, and uh, each of these different uh, states of matter can be used to excite and create the population inversion that we talked about last time as an important condition for the stimulated emission. What are the most important requirements for the materials that uh, laser cavities would be made out of? Number one, they have to have a suitable energy levels that would support the population inversion. Uh, the excitation energy must be able to reach the atoms and molecules. In other words, the excitation energy that's uh, to be pumped from the outside to create the population inversion should be able to reach the atoms and molecules of the material. And finally, the input energy must selectively excite the atoms or molecules to the right energy levels for the sake of the population inversion that we need for the simulated emission. It's important to mention that solid lasing materials are usually non-conductive and in such a case they can be excited by the light only. In other words, if you have a solid laser material like a ruby, as you can see here on the right hand side, you can uh, pump the energy only through the light, so you would have some sort of a pump source that's going to be either a light bulb or another laser. On the other side, the gas lasing materials can also be excited by the electrical current. So for example, if you have a helium neon type of a laser, that's a gas laser, you may be using electricity since that type of a gas has conducting properties. And finally, we also want to mention that Certain lasers are using semiconductive materials and in such a case semiconductors can transmit both light and the current so the pump source can both come in the form of electrical signal or a light source. What you see here on the right hand side of this slide on the top right hand corner is a ruby. That's the solid material that's been used to create the first uh, laser back in 60th of the last century. And then in the picture on the bottom right hand side we have laser cavity and then we can see here also this bulb that is sending the light and pumping the energy into our laser cavity. The materials that are being used for laser cavities can come in different forms and shapes. Very often the laser cavities are made in the shape of long thin rods or gas filled tubes with mirrors on each end. Although we have some new lasers, so-called disc lasers, where the lasing cavity or lasing material is not coming in the shape of a rod, but rather of a disc. Long rods or tubes are needed for materials with low gain per unit of length, and they typically have highly reflective mirrors. 
On the other side, we have plenty of common semiconductor lasers that are very small. In other words, the lasing cavity in the case of a semiconductor lasers can even be of a size of a grain of salt, so real small. The laser structure can also be chosen to ease the dissipation of the waste heat. A lot of these lasers are heating up, so you have to have some sort of cooling structure that is going to enable proper operation of a laser. We also want to talk about laser output characteristics. Now that we know how the lasers operate and what are the most important parts of the laser, we want to see what type of output the lasers produce. Obviously, it is going to be some sort of laser beam, and that laser beam is going to have a certain characteristics that are listed here. So we would want to analyze the laser beam of a specific laser from a perspective of a laser line width, coherence, laser beam divergence, beam waste, near field and far field beam divergence, and finally the beam diameter. The first important output characteristic that we would want to briefly elaborate on is the laser line width. As already mentioned before, lasers are producing a coherent and monochromatic light. In other words, the laser beam that's being produced by the laser is coming in a single color. That's not entirely true. It turns out that there is actually a little bit of a bandwidth around the uh, central uh, wavelength that uh, laser produces. The way how we can explain this is the wavelength is pretty much defined by the difference in energy levels between the two orbits at which the electrons are moving up and down, uh, creating the stimulated emission. So for example, in this case here, we have the ground state of the electrons or atoms, and then we are pumping the light, moving the atoms into uh, excited levels. We also remember that uh, we also had a, a gassed atom where we can uh, have electrons moving over and then thus creating the population inversion. And then we have seed photons that are going to be hitting these excited atoms. And uh, when the, these excited atoms are hit, uh, they will be dropping the, their electrons down to the lower energy levels and then uh, producing more of the photons. And the wavelength of the photons that have been produced is pretty much defined by this uh, distance in the energy levels between the excited energy level and then the lower uh, final level. And it turns out that these two energy levels uh, on these two orbits are not just like a single energy level, but, but there is a certain interval of energies at which the electrons uh, on excited level can be as well as certain level of energies that electrons will be when they move down to the non-excited state. In other words, there may be a slight differences in wavelengths of the photons that have been produced and that's why we see this curve here uh, for a specific laser so we have some sort of central wavelength uh, central color as well as a little bit of a shades in other words you're gonna have some photons that will be uh, having the wavelengths slightly off of the center wavelength of the uh, laser. If we measure the range of the wavelengths that our photons produced by the laser, then that parameter is going to be defined as a laser line width. Next important parameter to introduce and to talk about, very important, is the beam divergence. It turns out that the laser beam that's coming out of the laser has a certain cross section and it's going to be spreading out as that laser beam is moving away from the aperture of the laser. So the laser beam divergence defines the beam width spread as the light moves away from the laser source. So beam divergence means the increase in the width of the beam. The beam divergence is actually an indirect measure of the coherence of the beam. Smaller beam divergences are indications of the better coherence and longer coherence lengths. We are going to talk about this important parameter called coherence. Just remember for now that the coherence directly affects the divergence of the laser beam. You can see on the picture on this slide, on the left hand side we have a, our laser that has a certain beam diameter at the aperture and as we are moving away from the left to the right we can see how the width of the beam is spreading out. So farther away we are from the laser the beam is going to be wider. The beam divergence is measured in the units of angles. We can see that this specific laser here has a beam divergence of about one millirad. The next one is a beam waste. This is directly related to certain changes in the width of the beam that are created to the focusing optics of the laser. It, it turns out that many lasers are using a focusing optics to improve on the divergence of the laser beam. And you can see the converging lens here used in the picture on this slide. So this converging lens is going to affect the divergence of the beam to the point where you're going to have the laser beam that's going to look like the one on the right hand side. You can see that to a certain distance away from the laser the beam is actually converging due to the focusing abilities of this converging lens 
and then at specific location it's gonna again start diverging so there's this specific location certain distance away from the focusing optics of a laser where we would have the minimum width of the laser beam and that minimum width of the laser beam is so-called beam waste so to wrap up in the design of cavity mirrors it's sometimes desirable to design the output coupler as a converging lens when the inner surface of the lens serving as the output coupler mirror in such a design the emitted beam first converges and then diverges as can be seen here on the right hand side the position where the beam converges to a minimum diameter before diverging again is called a beam waste if the beam diameter is measured near the output coupler the measurement of the beam divergence will be in error because the beam is not yet uniformly diverging so that's also an important uh, lesson from this slide if you want to evaluate the divergence of a laser you have to keep in mind that you want to be at certain distance away from the laser aperture to pass the beam waste otherwise if you're doing the measurements in this area here between the focusing optics or aperture of the laser and the beam waste you're going to be getting uh, faulty results for the beam divergence so in order to correctly measure the beam divergence the beam diameters have to be measured at a sufficiently long distance away from the beam waste the next to mention is a uh, laser light intensity here we are talking about the total power of the laser over a unit area so keep in mind that you may have two lasers of the same power let's say you have a laser one that has 10 milliwatts and then another laser two that also has 10 milliwatts however the laser one can have the power of 10 milliwatts spread over a smaller area as opposed to laser two that may have a spread of 10 milliwatts over the larger area so you really have to take into account both the power of the laser and the width of its beam in order to come up with a laser light intensity so the laser light intensity very often the term that's being used is a laser irradiance is power of the laser over the area of the entire cross section of the laser beam obviously the irradiance of the laser beam is going to change as you're moving away from the laser because of the fact that the laser beam is diverging so the area or spread of uh, the power is going to be over the larger area as you are farther away from the laser if you're dealing with the lasers that are operating in a pulse mode uh, their laser light intensity is very often expressed in terms of uh, energy so you are not using the watts or the power but rather joules uh, if you want to properly characterize the intensity of the pulsed mode laser the next parameter to be briefly introduced is the laser beam diameter please don't mix up the laser beam diameter with the laser line width in the case of laser line width that we previously introduced we are talking about the spread of the wavelength well, in this case here, we are talking about the spread of intensity of the laser light over the entire area of the laser beam. So what you can see here is still a bell-shaped curve. We are dealing here with a laser that is producing only one mode. So if you're looking over in the entire cross-section of laser beam, you can see that at the center of the laser beam, you have the peak, meaning the intensity, the strength of the light is, is at its peak at the center of the cross-section of the laser beam. And, and as you're moving, farther toward the edges of the laser beam you are gonna have intensity of light going down we're gonna be using a device called beam profiler that can give us the properties of the laser beam diameter from the perspective of the curve like the one you're seeing here and again we are talking about TEM00 laser in this case whose beam approximates the Gaussian function or this bell-shaped curve as you can see here please refer to one of the previous slides where we covered transverse modes of a laser so the beam intensity falls off on either side of the beam center and can gradually decrease to zero. The beam diameter is defined as the distance between the two points. The way to determine the diameter of the laser beam is by looking at the peak of the power at the center. And then you're going to be looking at the two points closer to the edges of the laser beam where the power has been dropped to about 13.5% of the peak power. At those locations, you're going to have these two points, and then you're going to measure the distance between the two, those two points on the opposite sides of the laser beam, and that distance is going to be known as a beam diameter. So once more, you're looking at the peak of the power at the center, looking for two points closer to the edges of the laser beam where that peak power at the center has been dropped down to 13.5% of the peak and then measuring the distance between the two, those two points and that is going to give you the diameter of the laser beam. 
Let's also take a brief look at how lasers can be classified according to the type of a laser material used. So we may have a gas lasers where the active material is a neutral or ionized gas such as CO2 or helium neon. The next group is a semiconductor lasers where active materials are semiconductors. The diode lasers are kind of directly related to the semiconductor lasers. They are the most common type of semiconductor lasers. Then we also have a solid state lasers where the active material is some sort of solid material such as crystalline or or glassy solid and finally we also want to mention the fiber lasers and disc lasers where in the case of a fiber lasers we have active material as an optical fiber which is going to be a special case of a solid laser as well as disc lasers that are using a specific shape and form or geometry of the active material that also is coming as a solid material. Let's start with the gas lasers. Gas lasers represent one of the oldest type of lasers. Many solid state and semiconductor lasers have already replaced the gas lasers in many applications. However, the gas lasers still remain widely used and commercially important. So as already mentioned, the lasing medium in all gas lasers is some sort of a gas. So light emitting atoms and molecules are in continual motion contained within the tube and generally isolated from the air. For these types of uh, lasers we're going to be using electrical discharge to excite the gas because the gas is uh, going to have conducting properties. So there's energy transfer that depends on the gas or the type of gas. Turns out that a few gas lasers are optically, although there are certain exceptions where a few gas lasers can also be optically pumped and excited by chemical reactions. One of the most common types of gas lasers is a helium neon laser. This is the laser that you may have already played with in our photonics lab in a course one. So we are dealing with a laser that uh, is using helium and neon as gases inside of the laser cavity. These lasers are generally characterized by a low gain and they are very inefficient. As a result of their low gain, the helium neon lasers require highly reflective cavity mirrors with low losses and then an output mirror that transmits only a small fraction of laser light. It turns out that just about 0.1% of the electric energy that we are pumping into these lasers is going to be turned into a useful laser beam. We also want to mention excitement lasers. These types of lasers emit powerful pulses in ultraviolet range. Why we are choosing these to uh, bring them up here on this slide is because they have found a very, very uh, broad applications in the largest market uh, such as writing patterns on the semiconductor integrated circuits as well as the laser refractive surgery. It turns out that the light emitters in these lasers are unusual short-lived molecules called excimers and composed of one atom of a rare gas and one of a halogen that exists only in excited state and it turns out that when they drop to the ground state they lose the energy that held them together and then they fall apart. So a very specific type of a gas laser that has found many applications as already mentioned, LASIK surgeries as well as creating photonic integrated circuits is where you're gonna find these types of lasers. Here's a little bit about solid state lasers. So here we are using active material in a solid state. We're talking about transparent non-conducting material whose atoms can absorb pump light and emit laser light. These solids are non-conductive, so in this case the active medium is going to be pumped using a light. You can see on the picture on the right hand side this uh, coil shape type of uh, pump source that's uh, some sort of a high intensity flash lamp that is pumping the light energy into the uh, cavity of our laser. An example of solid state laser is a ruby rod laser. That's actually the first laser that has been invented back in the 60s of the last century. So this type of laser is using a synthetic ruby which is a crystal of a sapphire a uh, transparent form of aluminum oxide containing a small amount of chromium that gave it a pink color. And again, as already mentioned, we are using a high-intensity flash lamp to pump the light into uh, this uh, active laser medium. Another type of solid-state laser are so-called neodymium YAG lasers. This is the laser that you're going to be extensively using in a course 4 of uh, this course series. We are talking about highly versatile and widely used neodymium type of a laser. So we are talking about neodymium that's widely used in a solid state lasers. That's a rare earth element. Uh, the strongest neodymium line is at 1064 nanometers in the common host YAG. YAG stands for a garnet. That's a host material. With harmonic generators, neodymium lasers can also generate 532 nanometers second harmonic in the green range, as well as the third and fourth harmonic uh, down in the ultraviolet range. So let's briefly introduce the structure of this laser. 
What you see here on the left hand side is a diode laser, that's the pump source. So that is going to be, that's a different laser that's pumping the energy into our neodymium YAG laser. And then here in front of this uh, diode laser, you can see here the focusing optics. It turns out that the diode lasers have a very large beam divergence. So we would want to focus that beam, we want to collimate the beam and focus it. And that's why this focusing optics here is uh, used for. And next one is our neodymium YAG rod that has a mirror on one side, a mirror over on the other side, where the whole lasing action takes place. And then you can also put this KTP crystal here to do the process of so-called frequency doubling. So what basically happens here, here is you're starting with a diode laser that's uh, usually about 808 nanometers of uh, laser light. And that uh, pump energy is creating the lasing action in our neodymium YAG laser producing 1064 nanometers infrared type of a laser beam. And then this KTP crystal here is gonna take those 1064 nanometers in infrared and uh, cut it in half down to 532 nanometers. And what's gonna come here is the laser beam at 532 nanometers, which is the green color. And then back here, you have some sort of filter to remove any infrared light. And then what you're gonna be receiving back in this photo detector is going to be the green light. So it's a relatively complex laser system that is present in our lab that you're gonna be working on in the course four. And finally, as one of our very popular lasers these days, we also want to mention fiber lasers. So here we are talking about specialized type of a solid state laser in which an optical fiber replaces the traditional rod. Fiber lasers are able to generate continuous laser powers from milliwatt to all the way to tens of uh, kilowatts. So what we have here is an active medium or laser cavity in the form of optical fiber of a relatively long length. We also have this laser in our lab. You're going to be doing hands-on experiments on a fiber laser as well. The fiber laser that we have in our lab is in the range of a few watts. It's a class 4 laser that can create a significant damage on a brick or even can melt the plastic. Uh, so again, fiber lasers found many applications, especially in a material processing. They are very often used to cut the metal and, as I said, very popular these days. So in this lecture, we went one step further and, and introduced a few other concepts related to the lasers, laser construction. We have talked about laser cavities, mirrors, materials that are being used as uh, active uh, lasing materials. We also looked at a few important output characteristics of uh, lasers. And finally, we mentioned a few important classes of lasers based on the type of active material that's being used in this important optical device. With this lecture, we have come to the end of our course two, Geometrical and Physical Optics course. I hope that you enjoyed this course and that you expanded your knowledge in the field of photonics. I'm looking forward to your feedback and also hope that we are going to continue this journey together into the next course, course number three, where we're going to be learning the concepts and applications of optical fibers.